Good evening, everyone. It's Gordon Stone here. I'm one of the, uh, the principal mentors and deliverers of the Northern Beef Business Mentoring Program. Tonight, our webinar is entitled The Top Five Golden Rules of a High-Performing Business. And uh, the two presenters tonight are myself and Mark McNamee, um, who is a co-presenter. Evening, Mark. How's it going? Yeah, good, Gordon. How are you? Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Mark. Um, just a quick introduction. Um, from my point of view, um, I've been involved in the business mentoring, business coaching um, area, business strategy area of the agribusiness sector for well over 20 odd years. Um, worked across a number of sectors, uh, worked internationally, and I guess my real passion is working with business owners and those people in the agri sector who want to make a difference, who can see the opportunities, and our job is to work with them to help support them in that change process. And that's really what the Northern Beef Business Mentoring Program is all about. It's creating high-performing, self-managing, profitable, high-end businesses. That's our objective, and of course, the business is one thing, the people is yet another thing. So Mark, would you like to introduce yourself, your sales coach role, your key account manager role, and so on? Yeah, thanks Gordon, and hello everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's webinar. Um, my introduction is that I'm an agronomist. I'm, uh, I've uh, got a hort science degree, also got a marketing degree, um, my background is probably 30 years of agriculture in one form or another, uh, most recently um, as Landmark's uh, National Key Account Manager. Um, so yeah, that's my background, been working with agribusinesses um, throughout Australia, Southeast Asia and North America um, yeah, for that 30 years. Thanks, Mark. It's and it's a real pleasure to have you as part of our um, our team, as you have been for some years now, um, and to be involved in the Northern Beef Business Mentoring Program. So, before we move on, I'd like to give um, everyone some quick insights into the mechanics of webinars, because I know there are some people out there who um, just like a quick introduction to how it all works. I know a number of people have joined us tonight by phone. A number of people have joined us by uh, internet-based systems. Um, and you'll see on the top right-hand corner of this slide that um, we've actually taken the liberty of muting everybody um, because of the bandwidth and uh, other internet issues in rural Australia. Um, there is an opportunity, though, for you to type in some questions. And you don't have to be too concerned about the King's English or the Queen's English or, or NAPLAN or whatever it's going to be. Um, because Dave is sitting behind the scenes as one of the organisers and depending on how we go for times, he will uh, decipher those questions and pose them to us. Um, we are very aware of people's time um, and we're thinking that our objective is roughly half an hour for this program, depending on how it goes. So if we get to questions, well and good. If we don't, our commitment is that um, we'll take a summary of those questions and send the answers out to people after this program. Um, so let's just keep, uh, in, in the top left hand corner of this slide too, uh, will be the slides that you've now seen. So that's just give you, giving you a quick insight to how things will work. Um, <clears throat> before we get started, one thing I want to make uh, an observation about is that many people in agriculture regard business as being the production side of things. So I've used this analogy with many people and I'll use it again because it's nice and simple and clear cut. If you can imagine a, an overall business like an egg, regard the yolk of the egg as being the goodies that produce the product, whatever that may be. So it's the operations of the business, whether it be a beef business, a grain business, something else in the value chain or whatever else it may be. So fundamentally for a beef business, let's say it's the um, soils, it's the pasture, it's the animal, it's genetics, it's the nutrition, it's the mechanics of actually creating the product. What sits around the egg is the egg shell. And if you look at our 12 pillars of business best practice, I regard the egg shell as containing the business and that's pillar number two, the products, markets and customers. And for many people, there might be one marketplace, one customer, one product. For other people, there may be a range of different opportunities um, for higher value customers or commodity customers. 
and it's a, it's a question of thinking where's the most money to be made in the least time with the least effort. And that's really what the eggshell is about. It contains the whole business. The rest of our 11 pillars, in my estimation, fit within the white of the egg. So fundamentally having a clear vision, and we always make the distinction about people's vision compared to the vision for the business itself. So the business is being run for the people rather than the other way around. Um, thinking and acting like a CEO, there are some people who say, look, I don't ever intend to be another Woolworths. When you dig down to many people's businesses though, they are million dollar enterprises, maybe half a mil, maybe two mil, maybe five mil, whatever it may be. So therefore some corporate thinking comes into it, which is strategy, uh, return on investment, um, systematic approaches to things, all the things that are in these pillars. And that's what's thinking like a corporate entity. And the people who run that are CEOs and senior managers. On the other hand, there are operational people. So it's almost like you've got to step on one side of the line to think and act like the CEO and the senior management team, and on the other side of the line to think on behalf of or like or act as um, the operations personnel, which Mark will come to in a few minutes. We always talk about money. We talk less about gross margins, less about benchmarking, and more about some of these other elements in our 11 pillars. So they're all important. The golden rule is about profitability, of course. We talk about people and systems because people are what make the world go round, and the business is about managing the outcomes for the people benefiting from or managing the business itself. There are all sorts of people who play in the team space, and often it's families, often it's other personnel, often it's contractors. They're all part of the gig. Tonight we'll be talking much more about systems, so I'll carry that over for uh, further down the track. Business risk as well as production risk. All sorts of areas of risk that we need to dig into when it comes to these 11 pillars, our legal obligations, our succession, and one distinction I need to make here is that we, we think of businesses from the point of view of a defined end in mind. And the defined in, end in mind that we always say, our, say to our clients and those people we work with is, the discipline is, should in five years from now we wish to get an investor into the business or have a, take a high-end deal to a bank, we need to be in a position to say to those people, there is a systematic way of running this business. There is a very clear end game. There is a very strategic approach. It is very systematised. We do manage our risk. And that's our thinking about succession in a very proactive manner. Which leads us on to thinking about sales and marketing, communicating, building relationships with customers, value adding, leverage, all of those sorts of things. They're all the other elements of the egg white. So if we think of our five golden rules for tonight, um, we run a one day workshop program called the Better Beef Business Workshop. Its purpose is to get people to step away from their business and become the outsider looking in for a day so that they can think about what they want and need to do differently and better. That being so, these five golden rules are the sorts of things that we want to cover tonight because they are really quite critical to creating a high performing business. As we've said already, very clear about where things are going to head to from here. Taking time out to work on rather than in the business. Being systematic, being unique and measuring success. So let's move on now. For most people, the idea of a vision is sometimes very difficult to, to get their mind around. Vision can be regarded as somewhat nebulous. For some people, it takes some time to get their minds around exactly where things are heading to from here. So Mark, would you just like to give us some insights into why you regard vision as being important in terms of not only the one-day workshop, but also this program overall? Thanks, Gordon. By nature, um, people involved in, in farming tend to be action orientated. They tend to um, want to get things done. And um, so often we see, like I've got on the screen, we see that when there's a problem, when there's an issue, 
um, the answer, the apparent answer seems, just seems to be let's do more of what we've always done and let's just do it faster and often that doesn't really solve the problem. Uh, I find in my experience that um, in terms of the technical parts of, of, of farming, whether it be beef production um, or other aspects of, 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 of agriculture, um, you know, we've got some fantastic farmers uh, in Australia. What we, when we talk about vision, it's more about asking the question, why are we doing it? What are the outcomes that we're looking to achieve? So, you know, I like to say that, that direction is always more important than speed. The second thing that a vision gives you is that it directs the effort. So once you've decided on a target, it gives you that clear vision about what needs to happen and what doesn't need to happen. Um, can't decide that unless you know where you want to go. You can't make those decisions unless you know where you want to go. And the third part is that it then gives you the opportunity to develop processes that lead to um, appreciating or realising the target, or realising the vision that you, that you have for your business. Uh, it talks to um, what plans you want to create and then in turn what resources you want to allocate to bring those plans to fruition. Um, vision is the foundation of uh, where your business is going and, and spending and investing time in deciding what that vision is, um, is critical to uh, having a successful business. Thanks, Mark. And one thing I'd like to add to that is that uh, vision for many people is somewhat complicated to get their minds around and yet often we go from A to B via C and D through a circuitous route. Um, if we don't know where we're going to to get to B, well, the circuitous route can just always stay circuitous. So that's the big thing from our point of view. The other thing that I jump in and say there, Gordon, is that the vision does have to be owned by everybody in the organisation. Um, one of the things that we do come across is, you know, the, the trouble in getting everyone on the same page. So, you know, investing you know, a lot of time or sufficient time ensuring that, you know, it's a collective vision that takes into consideration all the the stakeholders, as we like to talk about, um, is critical to having a, a vision that's actually going to be effective, which leads to, um, you know, this next slide. Sure. And I guess a, a quick observation there too, Mark. I remember both you and I were running a workshop um, um, in central Queensland and we actually had two generations of one business sitting at the table. Uh, well, actually, we had one generation and we had the other generation not sitting at the table. And I guess that was a very telling experience for both of us to be sure that even though this young couple were misaligned, they, they had the capacity to bring it together. But because there was another person not at the table, it proved exceedingly difficult to actually get that specific engaged vision of all people and all money people um, connected. So would you like to take us through the elements of an effective vision, um, recognising it's somewhat confronting at times? Sure. Now, the, um, the seven bullet points that are on the, on the screen now uh, come out of a book um, called Leading Change by John Cotter. And, and John Cotter is one of uh, probably a legend in terms of change management. Um, it would be a book that I would encourage everyone to invest in if they feel that they're in, in working in an organisation or involved in an organisation that needs to undergo some sort of change. And uh, he characterises what an effective vision is into these topics. That is that the first thing it, it needs to do is convey a picture. It needs to actually give uh, those involved um, some idea of what the future is going to look like. So it's got to be imaginable. Um, the next thing is it needs to be desirable. This is a very important um, uh, point. Those that are involved, it needs to appeal to their long-term interest. And I underline the term long-term because there might well be, need to be some short-term sacrifices to get to the long-term the long um, or appreciate the long-term vision. It needs to be fe feasible. Now, that 
speaks to itself. But when we consider things like the resources that are available and are they sufficient to achieve a goal has to be taken into consideration. So there's an aspect of measuring what got we have available and then uh, talk about a plan of how we apply those, those resources. It needs to be focused, it needs to be clear enough so that it actually guides decisions on a day-to-day, -day, week to week, month to month basis. But on the same token, it needs to be flexible enough to be able to deal with um, unforeseen circumstances that might show up. So there's that, that challenge around vision where it needs to be focused enough, focused enough to guide decision making but flexible enough to deal with those unforeseen circumstances. And in agriculture we get a lot of that. I mean weather is one of those things that we can't control. Um, so having a flexible enough plan to deal with changing market conditions, changing weather conditions is a really important part of having an effective vision. The, the last one, and, and particularly this is my you know, area of expertise because I work a lot in marketing, is that you know, it needs to be communicable. If you can't say it in five minutes, then it's too hard. And, and it's interesting because I'll go into an organisation and they'll say we have a vision and you know, five or six pages later, um, we're still talking about it. Uh, to be able to describe what it is you want to achieve in five minutes really does hone the skills. It hones the thought process. It makes sure that you're focusing on the things that matter most. So in terms of a vision, this is a wonderful list um, to run your vision through to see if it qualifies as being something that would be effective in what you're trying to accomplish. Thanks, Mark. And one final observation before we move on is I've had a number of experiences of being in businesses where there is complete lack of clarity about a vision. On the other hand, where there's a nice definable communicable vision like you've described, it's surprising how many people step up and up and up because they're engaged more in the vision than many other components of the business. They're prepared to do whatever it takes to get to the end game because they're engaged with the vision. So let's, let's just move on to, um, to golden rule number two, which is working on your business, which is a complete passion of mine, I've got to say. Um, so it is indeed, as we've put here, the helicopter view. And so it's actually critical um, to, to set up a new habit or pattern um, amongst the senior leadership team of the business. And I, th I feel it's almost easier to, to go away from the business to actually spend the time to work on the business, to take that helicopter view so that we sit there with, with our minds engaged and say, where do we need to go? How, how are we going engaging with that vision? How are we going breaking it down into bite-sized chunks? And while we talk about the plan, um, it's also breaking it down into what we call steps to change. So those bite-sized chunks so that people can actually understand how we're going to go through the change process. We have a little discipline, which I mentioned earlier, and here it is on this slide, which is working on the business, working with the vision, is how to get the most money in the least time with the least effort. That's our focus. That's our discipline as well. The most money, the least time, and the least effort for ourselves and for our clients to work with our clients in this mentoring process to achieve that outcome. We also have a saying, a principle used by Marshall Thurber, one of the, I guess, most successful marketing people um, um, for many, many decades, was the concept of clarity leads to power. So it's a small p. It's not power over other people. It's about self-empowerment. So the clearer we are about setting our intention, defining our outcomes, the greater potential there is to get to where we need to go. So that's really this helicopter view. Mark, have you got anything to add to the helicopter view of working on the business? Well, you know, I like results and, and when you take the opportunity to step out of your business and work on your business, you, you, tend, to, you tend to get um, a list of priorities, you tend to get really real clarity about what it is you need to do and I've, I've got a really a nice little story that you know, probably some people have heard but it does illustrate um, quite well what we talk about 
um, and what we mean by stepping out of your business and working on your business rather than in your business and, and, and what it means in terms of clarity. Um, I like to tell a story of, of, of a university lecturer who had um, a bunch of students who were complaining about how much work they had to do and, and, and he got sick and tired of listening to this each week. So he thought he'd actually do a little demonstration. So he came into class one day and he put on the, on the table a large glass jar and he told them that he wanted to address this issue of time management. And so what he proceeded to do was from behind the counter, behind the desk, he started to fill up this glass jar with, with rocks, large rocks. And when he got to the top, he said to the class, he said, now is this jar full? And of course, they all looked at the jar and they said, yes, it's full. And so then he nodded, he leant down from behind the counter and he pulled out another glass jar that was full of sand and proceeded to pour the sand over the top of the rocks until it filled all the space right between the rocks, right to the top. And then he asked the same question, is this glass jar full? Now by this time, they're a little gun shy. So they're kind of like giving you that diagonal nod about whether uh, this jar is full or not. And so they came to the conclusion, yeah, it probably was full. And so then just to really make the point, he pulled out a jug of water and started to, to pour that uh, until the jar was completely full with water and then asked the question, is the jar full? And of course they said, well, it must be full now. And then he asked the question, what's the moral to the story? And they said, and answering you know, the obvious, giving the obvious answer was that there's always room for more. And he said, no, that's not the answer. The answer is you put your big rocks in first. And that's the point. When we step out of our business and we work on our business rather than in our business, we get to identify what are the big rocks and then we start to plan to put them in first. And, and that's the, the great benefit of doing golden rule number two, working on your business. So thanks, Gordon. Okay, Mark, thank you. Well, let's move on. Um, so this is going to be yet another conversation about the end in mind. Um, I noted earlier that one of the disciplines that we bring to programs like this is to say, if we're going to put a fully organized and structured proposal to an investor, or a fully structured, organized and disciplined proposal to a bank manager, what are some of the questions that they're going to ask? And one of the questions that will always be asked is, can you, the business owner, step away from the business for two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, or whatever it may be, and have the business run without you? So fundamentally, systems are absolutely critical to that whole process. So Mark, could you elaborate on some of these points about systems? Yeah, it, it, this is a simple, a, a simple concept, but one that's not done well. And, and particularly, you know, it's a broad statement, but agriculture is one of those industries where it is all about action and, and some of the production timelines are very long. And so we, we get very involved in, in our production systems and, we, and like I mentioned before, we do that very well. But some of the business controls, they're the systems that we're going to focus on in both the one day workshop and in the CEO mentoring program. Now the same principles apply, it's just in a different part of the business. So what the systems give you? First of all, they give you the ability to predict. And depending on you know, the inputs, some of that predictions um, uh, you know, a higher risk than others, but nonetheless, a system gives you the ability to be able to predict. The second thing is it gives you the ability to be able to control. So once you're in the plan and you're up and running, you know which lever to pull, when to pull it, because you've got systems that are in place that give you that information. And the third thing is that it allows you to report. So when you've got to know the score, when you've got to report to maybe an investor, or when you've got a report to a board, or even if it's just knowing yourself where you're up to, um, it's really important that you have that ability to be able to, to pull stuff out quickly and know where you, where you are. Um, 
you know, it's it's such a, a, a an important part of what we do and and what we talk about uh, in both those programs, developing uh, wonderful, effective systems. Um, is well worth the investment. Thanks, Gordon. Yeah, good, Mark, and thanks. And this is a very topical issue because uh, today I actually had a meeting with a cotton grower um, who said to me, mate, I've got some serious problems with this business. Um, I'm on to my third property now and I just feel like I've got, you know, a, a tiger by the tail. So I said, well, w what's going on? And essentially he said to me, look, the problem is with my people. I, you know, in order for us to run this business well, I need more and more people. And now I'm just running myself ragged managing the people. And so the moral of that story or, and the rest of the conversation was around creating systems to allow the people to manage themselves in a fairly disciplined industry like cotton. But equally, I would say that it's quite possible to run a disciplined, systematic business virtually wherever you are by simply spending the time and effort to think through the system, particularly with that end in mind that we've just described. So golden rule number four is about being remarkable. And once again, I'm going to ask Mark to take us through this process uh, because this really comes down to our sales and marketing strategy, which is one of our key pillars. And you'll notice by now that we're actually coming and going across a number of those 12 pillars. The thing that I'm most passionate about is um, item number one. So I'm going to take liberty and just describe that for a moment. USD stands for a thing called the unique selling distinction. So what's that all about? That is what sets us apart from the marketplace. So once again, I've had a conversation with somebody today who said, um, my, my greatest concern is that we're in a commodity position but essentially we want to be able to reposition ourselves in the marketplace. So we started the conversation about what was unique about them as the business owners, uh, himself as the business manager, uh, others on the team, um, and then we got onto the whole conversation of when does price come into the equation if we're negotiating about a deal. And the, the outcome essentially is if there's some form of unique selling distinction, some things that we do differently or better from our competitors, then generally speaking, that's the first part of the conversation and price comes at the end. And price is a lesser of an issue because we've talked about the story, the remarkability of what happens, the capacity of the business owners, the quality of the product, and on it goes. So Mark, could you just take us through this concept of remarkability or uniqueness? Uh, again, the slide being remarkable, what we're talking about are what are the characteristics of remarkable organisations. Um, and, and I'm sure everyone can read them, read them on the screen. The one I'd want to emphasise is point number seven. Um, developing storytelling skills, developing the ability to communicate effectively um, to your customers particularly, which is a passion of mine, uh, but also others that have a stake in the business need to know um, where the business is at and what the direction is and, and what the accomplishments are and what's that unique value that you're bringing to, um, uh, to the business relationship. So when we go through them one to seven, um, you know, the one to six are really important. You need to, to have them as part of the characteristics of your organisation. But number seven is the one that pulls it all together and puts it in a place where it actually makes a difference. And, and being distinct, being remarkable, again, like we say, consider it that if the opposite of being remarkable is just being forgettable. And, um, and if you're going to add value, if you're about building profit, which is what we talk about in this business, being profitable is about being remarkable in some way, shape or form. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks, Mark. Let's move on. Um, measuring managing and celebrating success. One of the most important things from the point of view of business owners is being able to monitor what's going on. One of the unseen things that often, often trips people up is the, cap the capacity to celebrate success, to look back over our shoulder and say, I'm amazed at how much I've done, now I'm ready to go the extra mile to get, get to the next step. So. 
let's just um, deal with this for a moment, Mark. Can you just, um, I guess, address the measuring, monitoring areas of the business, the obvious and less obvious? Yeah, again, I want to talk about, uh, you know, there's lots of different ways that you can get to a profitable business. And, and I put up the example of the, of the movie Moneyball to illustrate the point. Um, what happened in that movie, if you can remember, is that uh, a struggling baseball organisation wanted to be successful and found a different way of being, of being successful. They looked at and studied the market, they studied the participants in the market and chose a different way to measure success. Um, I'm not a great baseball uh, aficionado, but um, they looked for average. They looked for people who could get on base rather than people who had uh, home runs. Uh, it was an interesting case study, and of course it was a it was a, a somewhat historical movie. I guess they took some liberties with it, but it really did the understand the, or illustrate the point that what you measure is what you get, and to measure progress. Um, does help us get to where we want to go. Now there are some obvious ones, and and when you're when you're in production, doesn't matter what industry you work in, um, you get passionate about certain numbers, and and I've listed those uh, as the obvious ones. But the not so obvious ones, the ones that are not looked at as frequently as perhaps uh, they might be, are things like the the profit and loss statement, the balance sheet, the aid trial balance. Who who do you owe money to, and who owes you money? Um, you know, what is your customer inquiry level? Um, what are your conversion rates against customers, uh, customer inquiry? And then what is the customer satisfaction rate? If you're not measuring those things, it's about hard to know whether you're, you're being successful or not, or you actually end up do finding out if you're successful or not, particularly on the not side because they just stop buying your product or, or your, your price starts to fall away. Um, but having those, those ways of measuring and then celebrating um, the success um, is golden rule number five. Thanks, Mark. Um, one of the things as we draw this to a close is that um, when we're talking about customers, when we're talking about this engagement with the marketplace and so on, what we're once again doing is setting the business up with the end in mind, which is let's say one of our objectives is to have an expanded business, either let's say more, more properties or involvement elsewhere in the value chain then ultimately we're going to get far more engaged in the conversations about the not so obvious elements and going to get far more engaged in the issue of engaging with the customer, defining who they are, what their needs are and how we're going meeting their expectations. So as I draw this to a close, I'd like to briefly just recap on what this Northern Beef Business Mentoring Program is all about because there'll be some people who um, have been exposed to this before and, and others not. So there are three important components to it. One is to provide information like we've done tonight, to give people the opportunity to think differently, to be exposed to some new ways of thinking, to fine tune their thinking, or to simply to be reminded about things that they already know. The One Day Better Business Beef, Better Beef Business Workshop, as we've described, is effectively about doing the stock take. What's going on with the business? What do we need to do differently or better? How are we going meeting these five foundational steps and other things that emerge? And then what we ultimately end up is what we call work-ons, the things that we actually need to work on changing. And there are many people who just say, that's fine, I can go off and do that myself. There are other people who say, well, look, we really want to fast track things. And the idea of being involved in this CEO mentoring program where we think and act like a CEO, where we're, where we're engaged with like-minded people, where we're caused to do our personal work, where we're caused to look at those work homes, where we're caused to think outside the square, where we're caused to engage with specialists, both from inside agriculture and outside, and then have discussions with like-minded people. It's actually the notion of what we call a mastermind program. So the idea of a mastermind program is you get like-minded people together and empirically there's far more power in a group of like-minded people getting together than just simply a group of the same number of people because it goes back to, I guess, the mental state and the engagement of the energy 
of all those people. So I've gone off into a little tangent there, but ultimately that's what the CEO mentoring program is about, is getting those like-minded people together and working collectively on the change and transition process and where ourselves as mentors come in and say, let's just check in with you on a regular basis to see how you're going. Just a couple of other things to make you aware of. Um, this is a program that has engagement with uh, Meat and Livestock Australia, our company, um, the producer organisations such as Ag Force in Queensland and others in the Northern Territory in Western Australia, uh, government departments, because effectively they are seeing as we see that opportunity is knocking right now for the beef industry as it is for the whole agri sector. So the more professional we can have the industry, the more professional we can have the top operators, uh, the more they can think about the business skills on the assumption that for many of them the production skills are uh, pretty much sorted or they know where to get the advice, then this is the opportunity that we're presenting. It's essentially a professional development opportunity. And as this program goes on, it will be less and less subsidised over time. Um, and so right now, 2016, it is quite highly subsidised. And ultimately, it's about getting the right people in the room so we can actually start the change and transition process. So um, for many of you, you already know where to find us. Um, but I would encourage anyone who's listening who thinks, I'd like to have a conversation with Gordon or Mark, these two people who are on the call tonight. Our phone numbers are there. We'd welcome a phone call from anyone. Those people who say, look, I'd just like to find out a bit more. Well, people in Ag Force and the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries in Queensland know what we're up to. So Dave, I think before we close, um, and, we, and I will talk in a minute about the, the feedback that will happen when people finish this webinar. Where are we up to? I mean, it's now 7.37, so we've been at this for a little bit longer than I expected. Where are we up to with um, questions, or is that something that we might hold over? Well, there's a couple of questions. Sorry. Hi, everyone, by the way. Uh, there's a couple of questions that have come through, but probably timing-wise, um, we might just take to respond to those people individually afterwards. Okay. It's probably the best, best course of action. Rightio. Well, thanks very much for that, Dave. Look, I'm, I'm very aware that we are over the half an hour, and that's always my, um, my preference is to keep a webinar like this to half an hour max. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for attending. Um, I'd like to, um, I, guess, um, I guess, put the offer back on the table. If, if you do want to have a chat to us, please do so. If you want further information, please let us know however suits. And please be aware that um, we will ask for a bit of feedback. And this is the, the discipline that we're collectively imposing on the program, which is to get responses from people so that we can say uh, the extent to which it's meeting people's needs. So um, if you could give us a bit of feedback, uh, that will help our thinking with MLA, uh, Ag Force staff and other people who are committed as we are to changing the industry. So if there's nothing further, Mark, anything further from you? No, I'm fine, Guy. Uh, Gordon. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate you taking time. Yep. See you soon. Likewise, and thank you all for taking the time, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, conclude there. So thanks very much for your time. Look forward to speaking to you all soon. Bye for now.